What's up, everybody, and welcome to Crash the Mode. Today we have our two Ryans, Ryan Eisenhuth and Ryan Smith. Welcome to Crash the Mode. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I am Ryan Eisenhuth. They call me the Rat. I've been mentioned on this podcast before, and I'm really, really excited to be here. I'm Ryan Smith. I've been on the podcast before. I've mentioned him a lot on the podcast before, and I'm also very excited to be here. And we also have a third um, hidden guest. You might not be able to tell who it is, um, <laughs> but he is sitting at this table. He's not a normal Patrick, but... I thought you were talking about the dog. No. There also is a dog in the room, but he's over by the door. So AI, guys. We were <laughs> yeah. just talking about this before the podcast started, but <clears throat> NVIDIA released a new software that lets streamers like read off a teleprompter, but their eyes will still lock onto the camera even while they're reading it. It's just... What's next? Uh, AI scares me. I don't know. I, I think it's a really cool technology to play with, but... I'm really worried we're going to start relying on it too much as like a society. I think, and particularly I see it from an artistic standpoint of you see this AI art, which I think AI art, it's pretty cool, but there's also some really like sketchy stuff around it. I mean, a lot of the AI steals art styles from other less known artists well, throughout the internet. And so like problems come up with that. And same goes for chat GP, chat, chat GDP or what is GTP. it? GTP. Um, as a writer, that scares me. That's my job. I write, and I don't think an AI. I'm fortunate enough to think that I, the AI, can never replace like human writing. You know, there's something so inherent to being a writer that is human. You can't just. You can create funny videos of AI writing. You can do really cool stuff with it, but it will never like be able to replicate like what is written by the human mind. I don't think any thing can replicate that. Maybe thousand years down the line, but right now, I just think we're in such a place where. That's not a thing. But that's the scary thing, because yeah. in a lot of ways, it can. Yeah. So I read the description of Crash the Mode on YouTube the other day, and I texted Mike right afterwards. I'm like, Mike, this writing is incredible. Describe okay. something so cool. And he's like, ChatGPT wrote it. And I'm like, what? I was finally, I was so proud of Mike because he like actually wrote something decent and it was a robot. <laughs> he said, this copy is great. Like, who wrote this? I didn't know who wrote this. I'm like, the robot. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but like the thing is, I'm a pretty good writer. You are, yeah. I and love your work. I couldn't tell the difference between a robot writer and a human. Oh writer yeah, I... in a formal description on YouTube. Yeah, you I, know. I think right now we're in a place where it can replace formal description like that. But it was also only a paragraph. Yeah, but when it comes down to telling an actual story, structure, the human like nature of story, because that's where I'm coming from as a writer. Because when, when the word writing comes up, I think about it in terms of like film and story writing. Not necessarily academic writing. Yeah, which is um, what I do. Yeah. Um, but right now, I don't think we can replicate that with an AI, which I'm fortunate for because that's my career, and I really would not like to be replaced by a robot. But in five years, it could be. Yeah. Yeah, like that's, chat that's GPT-4, we're at three right now. What can four do that this one can? Yeah. I read yeah. a really interesting article. It was on the Institution for Public Relations website that talked about the storytelling powers of some of these AI. And this article was from two or three years ago. But it talked about how like AI is trained on watching like all of these movies, mm -hmm. all of these classic books, and books like Hero of a Thousand Faces, that talk about the storytelling structures and characters and growing and building. And they're able to reproduce things. Yeah. And, you know, art as well, visual art. Yeah. There's been a few things people have posted that are paintings that I see and the paintings just they look beautiful but they're really just a bunch of pixels put together by an AI. Yeah is it, is it really art when you take out the human aspect? Of I that? would say no. I, I think would, art I mean, I depends know. on humanity but how do you know what's art and what's not yeah. when you can't tell the difference between what a human made and what an, uh, uh, an AI made? For my the thesis film I'm making like it's being all made in AI and so there's an AI called Mid Journey, mm -hmm. and it hasn't been released yet. There's only like the beta version. I applied, got denied, but this beta version, like you know how normal AI video, it like flickers and changes between yeah. like different things. No flickering. It wow. is just seamless. You can only render for three seconds. It only does three seconds of a video, but so seamless. There's no flickering. Yeah, it just I'd be looks interested like something to see else. that. Cause... They did one, and it was a person. He was just walking down the street. They turned him into a damn Lego. I. I think AI is good, but I, 
In terms of art, at least, I notice it a lot of the time. I think most AI art, uh, like AI art is pretty shitty. I think most of the time I'm just like, that doesn't, that's not anything. There's nothing there. People are like, oh, look, so like, I see a lot of the time on like Instagram or Twitter, like, look at what um, the Avengers would look like with Wes Anderson style. I'm like, first off, that's just steampunk. That's not Wes Anderson. Second off, that just looks like shit. There's no like, I don't know, there's nothing in it. So for me, and maybe that's just like a biased standpoint I come from because I'm, inherently wary of that kind of technology that replace replaces the people i work with and myself um yeah yeah well like <clears throat> so chad gpt passed the bar exam it passed the medical yeah, exam like is that. this going to change school and education and how we either take tests or just learn altogether? because like my roommate patrick like his discussion boards he just puts it into chat gpt and it does your homework for you yeah yeah the thing you have to think about in the contemporary world is like information isn't really power anymore. Every single person there can get all the information they need at the tip of their finger on a device. It's not hard at all. Yeah. But like what's going to matter in the future isn't so much knowing the information, which is basically how school functions. Like you take a test on the information that you need to know. But the skill of the future that's going to matter is your ability to ask a good question. Prompt and, generation. Yes. yes. And whether that is asking a question of an AI to get the information for you quickly and easily so that you can move on to the next thing, or whether that's asking questions to other human beings yeah. and growing in relationships with each other, too. It's going to be the, the market of the future is going to be a market based on questions instead of answers. Yeah. I, I think we're in such an early point of AI and like that kind of technology that we're kind of we're going to, you know, society works like a pendulum, you know, you swing one way and you swing back the other, like, um, and so right now we're swinging really hard towards AI developing that technology, but I do think we're going to push against it very soon. And we're going to find ways like, like when cell phones were introduced to children and, you know, teachers started finding ways so they can't cheat on their phone during a test. It, was it always successful? No, as someone who cheated with their phone on a test, <laughs> it was not always successful, but you know, I hope Mr. Dixon, my math, high school math teacher can forgive me for that. Um, I hope he doesn't see this. Um, He's going to listen and they're going to retract your diploma. I know. Um, but I do think, you know, if an AI can write something, what, what about using AI to detect if an AI is writing something? You know, I think... They made that. Uh, yeah, so like, there, so there will be ways... Right now, Patrick's using that for his school and f fortunately for him, I guess, he's, you know, getting out of college soon, but... Soon, you know, there will be technology that's like pushing against using AI to like cheat through school because I think it's it worries me that our society is heading in a direction where people aren't learning and they're just using it's less, crutches. It's, it's less thinking about things and just trying it's to it's find there's the no answers. thinking about things. It's <laughs> just, it's there's no it's I mean today we lack serious critical thinking skills. Most of society does, I would say. Um, we view something as so surface level. I see this personally in like a lot of the times the way people watch film and television, they, they just look at the surface level. They have no like desire. And we were fortunate enough in high school, all of us, we took media productions with our, um, teacher Mosk and she, we had a whole thing on critical thinking and like actually like, you know, looking at media beyond the surface level and like, which I looking back really appreciate because I think it has like really helped me, but a lot of people they don't get that, you know, it's, and so I think, unfortunately, with this AI technology, we might move in a direction completely away from any need for critical thinking at all, which is scary, like, because I think that's just, not to get super, like, political, but I think it's just another step towards, like, you know, the eyes of fascism. It's, it, it's scary. I mean, that's what's causing such a fascist movement these days is people don't critically think about things. They just yell and they hope their opinion's the loudest. That brings up another question I was going to ask. When we eventually make AI that's just smarter than a human, is that the leader then? Do we just be like, okay, you do everything? Or is it going to take over? There is a wonderful film from a series of films starting in 1984 um, from the man of cinema who I adore most, the godfather of cinematic technology, James P. Cameron. I don't know if his middle name starts with a P. Um, called <laughs> The Terminator. And... Um, Kind of spells out why I really hope that doesn't happen, because uh, I don't think AI would want us around in the future. Why we're humans only destroy things. 
at least that's what it seems like. We create. We're making a podcast right now. That's, that's true. You're I, right. I think part of the human condition is we create constantly is. strive to create new things. Yeah. It's not just all about we're destroying. Just, yeah, you're which right. In our generation, I think we're with decon with the rise of deconstructionism. Yep. I think oh. we we tend towards destruction more yeah. so than other generations. But I think that people are starting to get sick of that. I think that people oh, are starting to totally have the that. desire to create anew and make something better than yeah. what came before. Yeah, hundred um, percent. I think you see that in um, that rise of deconstructionism from a filmic standpoint. You know, you see all you saw these all, all these films that were like deconstructing genres. You saw. Um, so many films trying to like flip the genre on its head, do something you never expected. And then you saw this like reaction to it where you had something like the Lego movie and they're like, well, in order to subvert something, it, we just be exactly what they expect us to be. So the Lego movie was just actually about a kid playing with his Legos mm. in, in, at the end of the day. But now we're kind of seeing this trend away from it. This like Marvel is also very deconstructionist in a way, not in a good way, in my opinion. Um, but And it's like this leaning away from sincerity. And we don't see a lot of sincerity in film, but then you see like films like Avatar, Top Gun, these big blockbusters that are now coming out as a reaction to that and to everything that's going on in society as being these really sincere, love-filled films that are just what they are. They're not trying to like turn around everything and saying the world's a horrible place. What if the AI bot we create is filled with love, is loves every, every aspect Can of I the earth? Um, I think that love is very much unique to the human condition. And, you know, I am a Christian and I'm proud of that. The Bible teaches that humans are made in the image of God. And I think that part of that is that being made in the image of God gives us the ability to love. It gives us the ability to love other people. It gives us the ability to love objects in our lives. It gives us the ability to love greater than just a chemical yeah, reaction in 100%. the brain, which is what I believe. But the thing about technology, AI, it's not made in the image of God, it's made in the image of humans. And because of that, I think that there's a lot of things that it just can't do. Loving, the capacity to love being one of the most important. I guess, yeah. But we don't know either. We, we haven't had this yeah. like advanced AI technology. We don't know what is... Love is such... <clears throat> the way we speak about love, excuse me, is such a human yeah. condition. You're right. But if we were developed... AI technology that can yeah. pretty much, I mean, the Turing test, if it can pass the Turing test, if we can actually not even like see that it's human, can it love? What is, what is love to a robot? That's a perfect, I'm going to name an episode of a TV show that. Now. What if the robot is just tricking you and it doesn't love you at all, but it's telling you every single, every single thing you want to hear like a, like a sociopath almost? Um, I mean, it could do that. I mean, that's probably, that's what technology is. I mean, it's, we talked in my media ecology class about how a lot of times technology is a mimicry of something it is. greater. Yeah, so like a light bulb is a mimicry of the sun or a mimicry of a fire mm -hmm. or a candlelight or yeah. a torch. And, you know, I think that in AI that can create conversation, that seems natural. Like that's a mimicry of actual conversation with another human being. And the wonderful thing about humans, I think, is that they're so unpredictable in a lot of ways, yeah. but AI is very predictable. It is. Because it will just give you what you want, mm -hmm. whereas humans are more prone to disappoint. Yeah. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know, but it's part of the human condition, and that's what makes good, happy friendships, good, happy relationships such a meaningful thing. Yeah, I think something you said there, just turning back the clock a bit to like our conversation previously about like AI replacing like artists and other people and work, I think what you said is a mimicry. You can't replace the sun with a flashlight. You know, it, it'll essentially do the same job, but they're in no way the same thing. I think is the best way to like look at that in terms of what AI is, and I think always will be, is a mimicry of the human experience, a, a mimicry of human nature, but it's never yeah. actually that. How long does it take for something that's a mimicry to just appear so real that you can't tell the difference? Exactly. Yeah. And how should we react to that as humans? Yeah, push against it. In my opinion, like is AI? Trying? Are we doing that though? No. Some some of us are trying. Yeah. But like, there's no laws, there's no regulations of AI. People are just going gung ho because it's like, such a new technology. Yeah. It's like social media too. There's no regulations on like social media yet because it's so new. Even like, I mean, Twitter's only what 15 years old. Mm -hmm. Like, 
I'm older. We're all older than Twitter. We're I mean, all older yeah, we than all, all knew social media. When everybody first got an Instagram, and we were like, "Oh my God, what is this?" I, like, I, I remember getting a Twitter for the first time. I remember getting an Instagram, a Snapchat, and being like, "What is this? This is cool." Oh, I can just blur anything I want onto this app. Um, yeah, it's and it's still new, and I do think we need regulations on social media and those who run it because I think it's you've seen such a rise in there's a documentary that I have mixed feelings about. Um, it's called The Social Dilemma. I think mm -hmm. yeah. there's aspects of it I really like, but I mostly just really like the information it presents because it's really well researched, but like the way the documentary is made. When the girl smashes the box. It's a weird, yeah, like they have, they have those weird cutaways, but when, when the information is being presented, I'm interested in yeah. it. There is a like, and they present a graph in that. And since the rise of social media, you've seen this such like radical, like divide between the left and the right, in in America especially. Well, yeah. not even that, but since social media has come out, like the graphs for suicide and depression have all just yeah. constantly been going up it, from the use of Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. Well, one of the weird ones, I saw, I think I saw you like a tweet about it or something. It was, um, it's that since the, like, start, like, since people started really using phones, there hasn't been a rise in, like, car, like, car fatalities, like, I saw that and I thought that was interesting in terms of like yeah. seeing how like, you know, suicide rates and everything else is like, we've become more divided as a society. More people are depressed and like in the woes of anxiety and depression and all of that because of social media and these um, other things. But then you have like car fatalities. Less people are dying in car crashes than before we had phones. And maybe that's just because cars are safer and that yeah, might just be a yeah. completely unrelated thing. But maybe there's something there too that we're like, I don't know, we've become so aware of how dangerous cars can be because of social media, seeing people dying. I don't know. Yeah, some, something I wonder about, too, is like, is it really happening more in proportion to the population? Or, or is, is it, it or just, does it just appear that, like it is? That because we're, because we're keeping track of things and we're seeing more for the just, first time ever. And we're just yeah. more, I mean, in terms of... Um, mental health we're just more aware of yeah it's, it, like are, if you're comparing mental health from the 80s to now we're just so much more aware of mental health i mean well, especially in men we're so much more aware of like um i'm a women and gender studies minor and like a big part of my focus in women and gender studies funny enough is like masculinity because i think it's such an interesting topic how society treats men and how you know even though we are at the top of society in terms of gender we still are like because of that treated in such like poor ways in terms of men are never recognized for mental health things. I, um, you know, I've looked, I went undiagnosed diagnosed for years with a lot of things, including ADHD and a lot of things. Cause you're just, men are just expected to first off, not have feelings. They're expected to be hyperactive and funny and, um, shit like that. And I, I just think to get back to like the main point, I think you're right. I think we just recognize more of it now. We, we just have a deeper understanding of these topics. And I think maybe part of it, I do think social media has affected how people view themselves and others and has affected mental health. But I also think we're just more aware of all of it now. We're how more we, aware of everything. How do we fix social media then? What's the answer? What's the solution? <laughs> <laughs> Is there a solution? Um, getting rid of social media? I, as someone who's a fervent user of Twitter, I... I mean, I love that place because it's like a hellscape. I mean, it's just like so many stupid people saying so many stupid things and I cannot help but be entertained. Just watch the fire. Watch the building burn It's down. like a car crash. I just can't look away from it. Like, I, um, I don't know. Is there a solution? I don't know. The A book that's coming to my mind right now is Thank You for Being Late by oh, someone. I can't think of the author right now. But he talks about how the rate of change of technology is increasing at such a faster rate than human evolution. Mm -hmm. So he describes human evolution as a very linear, slow growth pattern, which over time it makes a big difference. But yeah, technology. the rate of technology changing is, yeah, exponential. Yeah. And, you know, he argues ultimately that one of the best ways that you can cope with this is just by continuing to learn, continuing to ask good questions continuing to get off the phone for a little bit and just be with people. Yeah. And that's one of the most important things that you can do in order to maintain that humanity that we've been talking about so much. Yeah, I was just I was just getting my hair cut before this and I was talking with um, my hairdresser and we were just talking about how much we hate texting people. I just so much prefer like a conversation face to face. And I feel bad because I'm like, oh, my friends are going to think I don't like them because I'm not texting them a lot. But like 
for the most part, I text like three people consistently, and it's my mom, you, and Maya, my friend from college, and that's about it. Like, I will send you a text or you a text every once in a while, checking in, but for the most part, it's just so exhausting, and it's so hard. It's so inhumane that it just feels, I just, I can't enjoy talking with someone over text that much. Like, it's not a real conversation. It's not. It's a mimicry of conversation. Yeah, exactly. In terms of what we were talking about earlier. But it's just interesting to see how we've grown and how we've changed. Like, yeah. back in high school, I was never not on my phone. Right. You would text in high school, you would be walking, and you'd just be texting, not even looking at the phone. <laughs> yeah, like, I was so good at texting. That, yeah. And I, I was doing it with, like, 98% accuracy, too. Mm -hmm. Like, autocorrect helped me with the rest, I'm sure. But, you know... I sent, you know, 500, 700 texts a day in high school, according to the phone statistics. Oh, it's man. awful. I might have sent like three texts yeah, a day. It, that, that was me <laughs> in high school. But then I started going to college. I started actually thinking about my relationship with technology mm -hmm. and the good things and bad things about it. And I realized very quickly, like, I'm neglecting the people around me. Mm -hmm. The most interesting thing in a room, when you're in a room with another person, is the other person. It's mm -hmm. not a screen. Yep. You have access to that screen 24-7. Yeah. You can look at it anytime I, you want. And so I think, yeah. putting it away, yeah. even just this year, I've really, really been challenging myself to not look at my phone when I walk from class to class. Mm -hmm. And instead, like I'm saying hi to as many people as possible yeah. when I walk by. I'm looking at the trees. Like It's spring now. The, the leaves and flowers are just starting to grow. It's yeah. beautiful. And you miss it so quickly if you don't get off your phone. Uh, I think technology is dangerous. I think it is beautiful. It is a great tool. But I think we're getting numb to it. I think we're, I mean, I, like I said, we're losing critical thinking skills because of it. And because of that, we're not looking at how, da a lot of people <clears throat> aren't looking at how dangerous it can be. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's like, uh, there's probably like some Greek mythology, like, equivalent to what i'm talking about but it's so, a, i can speak it, to that yeah, actually. yeah it's like the yeah. yeah it's like holding a torch that's slowly burning your hand like do you think ai like <clears throat> with the evolution of ai do you think that will fix the algorithm like will there be a time where instagram is like what do you how do you where do you want to be in 10 years and you're like oh i want to be fitter i want to make more money so the algorithm will show you like more working out content or more making money content or like i want to learn how to paint and, like, you can choose how you want, like, your next 10 years to be based on the information you're taking in. I think it already does in a lot of ways. It does. Well, it's, the it does, but it's you're, getting better. You're blind to it. Yeah, like you, the algorithm is... It's, yeah, when you're scrolling, it's scary, through, that, scrolling through Instagram, the experience is like, oh, that's good. I'm happy that it showed me that. And then I'm like, you I'm watch it, and then you move on. Yeah, or I'm like, you know, or, you know, I think we've all experienced talking about something like I'm saying oh man I'm going to a movie tonight then I scroll on Instagram and it's like oh it's showing me movie showings on like the ads and I'm like yeah that's fucking scary um I think the algorithm is probably the scariest part and the most necessarily like the most needed to be um regulated part of social media mm -hmm. I, I think it's dangerous the way that social media companies sell your information and that most people just don't know about it and I think we're so stuck in like so many conversations that we're not we're looking at something that's actually like really dangerous to us and that's actually harming society. It's crazy how many people I see don't realize that their like social media like page what they browse affects them. Like <clears throat> I was just I'm not going to name his name, but I was talking to somebody who's 45 and we were looking at his TikTok. Mm -hmm. All of it naked just naked girls, naked girls, naked girls and I'm like this this is not how you're supposed to be consuming. Yeah, I mean no, that's how it <laughs> happens though. Like <laughs> this is because like on my Instagram reels because I don't have TikTok. I'll like scroll through that and I'll see like a video of like one time I saw a video of a monkey and I was like, oh, that's a funny monkey. So I sent it to one person. Then I saw two videos of a monkey. Then I saw three. Then I saw four because I kept watching them and liking them. And I just like so now my Instagram reels right now is just filled with gorillas and orangutans and marsupials. Like yeah, I get so I get a weird <laughs> I, like I get a weird amount of them. But I'm guess I'm like I guess this is better than naked women. They don't. Like, just getting them publicly on my Instagram. Um, I don't know. It's It tracks you. It knows everything about you. Sometimes I'm like, does my phone know more about me than myself? Like, yes. it, it probably does. Like, 
it's it's a scary technology it's i would love to see what the algorithm like the top 10 things the algorithm always wants to show to me yeah I'd i would love, love to, to see, see the that. topics of this but I mean, unfortunately these companies are super closed off and i think with elon musk's purchase of twitter it's not going to get any more open soon no matter how much he's like wanting to be open and i do really really enjoy that the ceo of twitter clearly just does not know how to use the app if you followed any of the, if you've seen any of this stuff he posts i'm like dude do you know how your own app works like I don't think you know what you're doing. And it's very fun to watch a billionaire kind of fumble the bag. The worst part about Twitter is that <clears throat> when it when you post a video or a picture, it takes away the top third and bottom third of the picture or video. So you have to click in I if thought you it actually fixed want that, to see it. But it's not, no, on not on mine. Not on mine. Like it's awful. It's, Elon Musk, fix that shit. Yeah. It, Jesus. Yeah. Um I don't know. It's technology. Fearful. It's scary. All right, let's change it up to some more just broader questions here. Um, what's what's the purpose of life? <laughs> That's a broad question. What the man just said. <laughs> are, are we actually going with this question? I don't have um, an answer prepared. What is the meaning of life to you, Rat? So I, the Christian answer is very much hey. the purpose of human life is to bring glory to God and enjoy Him forever. And so that's what I try to live out in my life. Yeah. But I don't, it's hard. Like, it's impossible to constantly be bringing glory to God. And so I think the purpose of life is really just to, in a secular context even, is just to love the people, love the places around you, and do something to make this world a better, more beautiful place. Yeah. And whether that's something like making a movie, making a podcast that people can listen to and learn something you new. You do nothing. Whether it's, <laughs> you do nothing of use to this planet. Whether it's playing your trumpet and making some beautiful music to just brighten somebody's day or taking a picture. I do photography in my free time mm -hmm. as well and writing. But uh, Sponsored. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I didn't name the channel for a reason. But, you know, there's a right. lot of... Yes. And so, but if you're making... Making the world a more beautiful place, you know, I'd argue from a Christian standpoint, you really are bringing glory to God in one way or another. But uh, from a sec more secular standpoint, like if you're making the world a more beautiful place, you're doing something to serve your neighbor. You're not just benefiting yourself, you're benefiting the people around you. And I think that's a really, really beautiful thing. There once was a man from Nantucket. Uh, I don't know. I mean, he said it pretty beautifully. I mean, I I'm... Not super religious, actually. I'm like the opposite of religious, but um, whatever that is. But um, I, I agree. I mean, at the end of the day, it's about making the world a bit of a better place. Um, for me, that's like writing and making movies and just trying to make somebody smile. I, I think, I don't know. Is there a meaning to life? Who knows? It's just about living through it, too. It's about getting through the day sometimes. Um, I think it's different for everybody depending on your whole situation i think we all come from a place of like we get it a bit easier we all come from a place of like privilege being like looking the way we are being who we are um so it's easier to say that but i, I do think at the end of the day that is true um it's about being nice and leading you know with love. leading with love and um i think not enough of us are grateful for how much of a gift it, gift it is to like make somebody's day just a little bit better. I think that is the greatest gift I can, if I ever hear somebody say like to me or even like somebody tells me secondhand that like I made someone's day better, I don't think there's any more joy I could have. It's just like, it's a beautiful thing. And we don't appreciate that enough with all the, like the stuff on social media because all of it's become kind of clout chasing. Like, you know, I mean, I was going to use Mr. Beast, but honest to God, he might be a bad example. But the people on TikTok who, like, make those random videos of them giving money to, like, somebody at... But the second you point a camera, the sincerity is gone. Yeah. Like, the sincerity and the kindness is gone because they're clearly just doing it for content. I mean, you're still doing a good thing, but, like... There's an ulterior motive. From a Kantian that. standpoint, it's not <clears throat> necessarily about what you're doing. It's about your intention behind what you're doing. Yeah. And it's clearly you have a more... You have a selfish intention. And... In terms of Mr. Beast, I think it's that's an interesting like social experiment. The stuff he does, like because he is doing a good thing, and honest to God, like all of his profits and everything, like if you look at, it, he's just giving all of his money fucking away. Like well, he's, it's, he's like twenty five, twenty six. He's like, but us. like, but like, 
people criticize him, but I'm like, okay, he's doing this, and it's not him that's the problem. It's the fact that, like... Nobody else is doing it. The fact that this is a problem in the first place. The fact that he... We need this... This 20... What, how old is he? He's, like, younger. He's 26. Okay, he, he's older than us. That's, he... Anyways, the fact that he's like, we have to get this 26-year-old to go out and do this, like, shit, rather than just having systems in place that prevent this from happening, I mean, that's the real problem. I mean, critique him all you want. I mean, there is some critique to be had. There always is. But, like, at the end of the day, this guy is, like, he's, I don't know, doing a nice thing. And it doesn't at the, it seem like, I guess he's, I mean, he's doing it for clout, but at the same time. How does insurance not cover the how you so mr beast that i gave is the people a thousand really people yeah he cleared them of blindness through a surgery how does insurance not just pay for that surgery because the return on investment of that if you clear somebody of blindness then they can work like yeah there's so many things they can do to make money with no not being idea. blind and i don't know how some people don't have insurance i mean maybe i don't know the story i have never seen the video i've just like know around it it's cute and he recently did that thing where he fed a bunch of people in i want to Maybe Africa, I don't know, in like a, one of, in a starving country, and like, um, yeah, and I thought that was interesting, but I don't know. It's just it shows a problem, which I guess this has got off track from the whole what is life thing, but a little bit. Yeah. But like even like you were saying before, like just somebody making your day in the simplest yeah. way. It even is just somebody like I see this person when I'm walking to school, and they sell snacks <clears throat> in our school, and they just say hi yeah. just every time I pass yeah. by, and that always makes my day. Yeah. Like, Something as simple as that. And I feel like I listen to music too much. Like, I always have headphones in that I forget to do it or I forget to, like, just take in my environment more. But, like, it just makes such a difference. Just the littlest thing saying hi. Yeah, I think um, I wrote a paper last year in which I talked about an ethic of care. And ultimately, my conclusion after looking at everything is we need a daily act of care for other people. Mm -hmm. And so many people in this world, they do daily acts of care every day, but it's not for other people, it's for them, mm -hmm. you know? And that's important, I think. I quote um, Kyle MacLachlan in, in Twin Peaks when he said, give yourself a little gift every day. It's really important <clears throat> to, like, take care of yourself, but I think... Like, you I need to lot, take care of yourself so you can you care also, for other people. Yeah, like, but it's me going and taking a shower. But when it becomes me before you... you or, yeah, when it becomes me before you, it's just like, you know, that's a problem. I think. You think it's a problem for somebody to care about <clears throat> themselves more than they care about others? I guess that's, yeah, that's a, maybe a bad way of phrasing it, but I think, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's, I mean, that's selfishness, you know, is in <clears throat> Aristotle, he is probably my favorite form of ethics, which is his um, virtue ethics, and it's about reaching a virtue. It's about, Finding a balance, which I, it's how I try to live because mm -hmm. all the other ethical systems are about how to act. This is about how to be, I mm -hmm. guess, is the best way of putting it. Um, in, in virtue ethics, it's about finding a balance between all of your vices. Um, so everything has vices. You, you know, selfishness is a vice. You know, being way too selfish, putting yourself before everything else. You know, putting yourself... But then there's also selflessness. That is a vice. If you are putting everybody before you... You're just getting walked over. You're getting walked yeah. over. You're getting screwed over. And you're not caring about yourself. And self-care is extremely important. It's about finding the virtue. What Aristotle refers to as the golden virtue. That's what's important. Finding that middle the, of caring a lot about others, but also making sure you're taking care of yourself. And everybody's, in my opinion, everyone's golden virtue is different because everybody's vices are different. Every, you know... Um, some people are way too selfish, so their virtue, their golden virtue, is way more leaning towards selflessness. But like, it, it's all different; it's all relative. And I think um, you need to care about others a lot, but you also need to take care of yourself too, and that's really important. Yeah, in the biblical worldview, the Bible says very clearly, "Love your neighbor as yourself." It's the second greatest commandment according to Jesus, but. You can't love your neighbor unless you're also loving yourself. And just like Ryan Smith just said, it's very much a balance mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. You know, something as simple as taking a shower, like it's beneficial to you because you're going to be... Mm -hmm. You're going to smell you're good. You're going to smell good. But also just... But like if good. you don't take a shower for five days, 
not only is it going to make you feel bad, but it will keep you from serving other people. Yeah. Not even just smelling good, but just showering yeah. makes you feel good. Yeah. So you're going to make somebody else feel better. Thing, yeah. Like, yeah. I, I work as a resident assistant at Geneva College, and one of my biggest struggles when I first started is I want to always be there for my residents, the people that I'm leading. And that led me to stay up really late every night, making sure that if there was any need they had, I would be there to meet it. Mm. Yeah. But... And I told every single one of them, I'm like, if you need anything, call me. Day or night, I will answer. And that was like one of the worst things I did for me and for them. Mm -hmm. Because I was constantly exhausted. Yeah. And when you're constantly exhausted, you're not able to have those conversations that you need to have. You're yeah. not able to commit, uh, partake in those daily acts of care that I just talked about that you can do. You're not able to function. And so you need to be able to care for yourself. But is your purpose of caring for yourself in order to bring glory to yourself? Or is your purpose of caring for yourself in order to help other people? In order to, as I said before, make the world a more beautiful place. Mm -hmm. And like we were talking about, it's a balance. You have to yeah. be able to juggle both. It yeah. is. Yeah. So can we pause real quick? I have to pee so bad. <laughs> Why are people so happy? Un unhappy. There's okay. <laughs> Why are people so happy? Okay, wait. Show me these fucking people. Where the fuck are they? I want to be with them. No, but why are people so unhappy? I don't know. Life's tough. It's. I mean, every, everything's different. You know, everybody has their struggles. That's part of life. Um, so I mean, like going back to social media. I think seeing. I think social media always shows you. Or what you you know the grass is always greener mm -hmm. on the other side, and that's social media. You're always seeing the other side, so you're always thinking about how crappy this side is. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't get, and people don't really take the time to appreciate like the good things in life anymore because they're uh, at least I know I'm so go go go. I'm like on a set every weekend. I'm in classes every day, um, and so like it's really hard to just balance everything in life for me personally. Like like in terms of self care, I always try to like let myself watch at least three movies a week because those are like, that's my time to watch a movie, to sit down, turn off the lights and just like put on a movie. That's mm -hmm. my time. That's my self-care. But I also have to make time to like see other people because that's another element of self-care. I need my time alone, but I need my time with people. And I haven't figured it out, but I do think people are just struggle to find balance these days. And I think that's, that's the key to life, the balance. I think a lot of people are too tough, tough on themselves as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I read a book called The Age of Disruption by Bernard Stiegler. It's a really deep philosophical book. Mm -hmm. I can't say I recommend it unless you're interested in the really deep philosophical stuff. But one of the things he talks about is how the concept of friendship is disrupted in our, in our culture mm -hmm. due to our technological interfaces that we use to communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote a paper based off of his really, really deep, complex philosophical ramblings and tried to simplify them and make meaning for them that will actually be beneficial to people. And I wrote about the concept of friendships in the age of disruption. Uh, basically, <clears throat> without getting too far into that paper uh, for this podcast, one of the things that we talked about was that friendships are ultimately what give your life meaning. Mm -hmm. But the concept of friendship has changed radically due with the increasing, the exponential rise of technology. Back when Aristotle and Plato and Cicero and all of our Greco-Roman scholars who talked about friendship were writing, mm -hmm. you know, Cicero says that friendship is limited to maybe two or three people at the most throughout your entire life. Whereas today you go on Facebook and every person has 150, 250, 200. I have 724 friends, I think, on Facebook. And I have even more on Instagram. And, <clears throat> but in my paper, I concluded, like, again, it ends up being a mimicry of friendship instead of an actual friendship. Mm -hmm. And there's so few people today who actually are experiencing a real meaningful friendship that gives life meaning. So Aristotle talks about virtue friendships yep. based on virtue ethics that Ryan Smith talked about a second ago. But he says that virtue friendships are you share your life with another person. You not necessarily tell them everything, but you're sharing your life with them. And the thing that differentiates a virtue friendship from other forms of friendship that he talks about is that 
in virtue of friendship, you're constantly pushing the other person to be better. Mm -hmm. You're constantly listening to what they're going through and saying, how can you be better? What wisdom can we share with each other in order to grow in whatever situation this may be? I was literally, I was about to ask, what makes a good friend? Like, yeah. Is that no, what, yeah, there's a... Those three things. One of my favorite movies, uh, Good Will Hunting, has a line that kind of like just popped into my head right when you were saying that. Um, Matt Damon's character, Will, is talking to his therapist, played by Robin Williams, Sean. And Robin Williams, he's talking about like these deep connections, and he's asking Will if he has any, because he knows Will has none, because Will doesn't open up to anybody. Mm -hmm. And he has nobody that challenges him, is what Robin Williams said. And he said... And, you know, he brings up his one friend played by Ben Affleck. He's like, ah, Richie, Richie would lie down on train tracks for you, which I do think is, like, one really important yeah. kind of friendship. I have a lot of friends who, at the end of the day, they aren't going to challenge me, but they'll always be there for me. And I do think, while it's not necessarily virtue friendship, I think it's a really yeah. deep bond that you need. You need those people who are there for you no matter what you do. But at the same time, you need those, those people. Those friends are family. Yeah. yeah. That's family. That's pretty much what that is. And then you have your friendships, the people who push you, who you clash with, and that's what um, Rob Williams points out. And then there's actually a really, one of my probably favorite moments ever on screen is when, um, at near, towards the end of the film, Ben Affleck's talking and he actually pushes Matt Damon to just finally shut the fuck up and go do something with his life. Because he said, basically, he said, if I see you here in 20 years, I'm going to smack you. If I see you working on this construction yard with me in 20 years, I'm going to smack you because I know you can do better. And... Every day, the best part of my day is the moment before I walk to your door thinking maybe he's not going to answer today because he, maybe he finally fucked off and did something with his life. And it's one of my favorite. And that just made me think of that. And, and another thing you said about like friendship being a, um, a really deep, important part of happiness, I think it's the most essential part is, is that deep, close bond we have with people. And I, I wrote a feature screenplay recently and one of my favorite lines I wrote was um, one character who's kind of like on the verge of suicide and has pushed all of his friends out. He's talking about how his, it, it, I think he said something along the lines of, um, my friends have always been the best part of me. And there's more to that line where he says like, and now they're all gone. Um, it it's, it's, speaks true to how I feel. is like, my friends are the best part of me. And um, Van Gogh, who besides being just one of the greatest artists of all time, but also a beautiful writer. I, I, I've read a bunch of his letters he wrote to his brother and kind of included them in um, the screenplay I wrote. And one of them talks about um, like the cage of depression and sadness we are all stuck in at some point in our life. And he basically goes into this deep metaphor about being a bird who, who everybody thinks can't do anything because he's stuck in a cage. Um, and thinks he's like too lazy to get out of the cage, but it's not that. It's that like you know, it's just impossible to escape. And he talks. The only way to truly escape from our cages, these things that hold us back in life, the sadness, depression, anxiety, and and, and though it'll never be gone, that cage is always there. You can get out of it, um, and you all, and sometimes you'll go back to it. But basically, what he said is that true, deep relationships that, that that is the key to like escaping anything is mm -hmm. deep it, it, it's love brotherly love familial love any kind you know the love between you and me as friends yep. the love between me and my partner like you know anything like that it's just that's the solution it's each other and i think we've lost sight of that in our current age i think we forget about each other sometimes, even though we're so actively interacting with each other. We forget there's somebody on the other side of that screen, somebody else tweeting that it's these people we harass on the internet, including like celebrities that are like the treatment of celebrities on the internet is just absolutely like like horrendous. Um, we forget these are real people. We forget that we're real people sometimes. I think about that all the time, especially recently. <clears throat> I think I said this on our podcast, but like. I used to not like a lot of old people just because, like, they're cranky and old, right? Whatever. But, like, then I've started thinking, like, everybody used to be a baby. Everybody once was a baby who was super nice, didn't do anything. Like, discovers aging. <laughs> <laughs> Shut the fuck No, but I'm <laughs> No, I'm kidding. I know, I know. Like, <clears throat> we always are, 
like sending yeah. hateful texts to people or no, tweets yeah. over the internet and we don't realize how much that like no, actually it, affects it, you. It really does. I, I mean, thought he was going to say we're always sending hateful texts to old people. <laughs> <laughs> They're not on the internet. Yeah, we are. <laughs> um, no, yeah, I think, I don't know, we all have this joint human experience and we kind of forget that sometimes because yeah. we're so divided in so many ways because we put so many labels on things and everything has to kind of have Everybody has to be something. You have to be a Republican or a Democrat. You have to um, fall in line with this or this or that. And we just forget that we're all, at the end of the day, we're all people. Mm -hmm. We all should be treated as such. Yeah, people are always asked, like, what's your opinion on this? And I think that there's an expectation that you have to have an opinion on every single little thing yeah. that you face in life. But that's ridiculous. Because mm -hmm. to have a meaningful opinion that's actually going to help another person, you have to study a topic pretty deeply in yeah. order to have a true understanding of not just two sides but all sides going into any issue yeah and it just doesn't happen anymore i saw a tweet that said <clears throat> get it, this is getting back to happiness but it said the reason people are unhappy is because they're unconscious farmers so basically it like had a thread and what that meant was like you see a farmer he's not just throwing fucking corn seeds fucking potatoes like, all these seeds in one pile. Yeah. No, he's putting each seed in a little individual row. And sometimes, like, if you want to work out, sometimes maybe that's just the seed is doing five push-ups a day, but you're still planting those five seeds every day that maybe someday will turn into a flower. Yeah. But like, I feel like so many people are just throwing all these seeds in this giant pit, covering it, hoping that a fucking goddamn lily's going to sprout, but you need to be organized. Yeah, it's an investment. It's a sacrifice you need to make. If you want the flower to grow, you can't just plant the seed. You also need to make sure it's in an environment where it's going to get sunlight. You need to water. You need to water. It. It. Yes. You need to put fertilizer into it, and it's it's the same with friendships too. Uh, Bernard Stiegler talked about how every friendship that's meaningful is an investment. It's mm -hmm. a sacrifice that you make. Like, I remember one of the times where I was the most astounded in a very positive way by friendship was when your father passed away mike mm -hmm. and you know we had all gone our separate ways at that point going to different colleges different states all over the country except for ryan smith ah, I, I knew that was coming i knew that was but yeah i was stuck in high school you know, still. yeah but when that happened every single one of us stopped what we were doing mm -hmm. and came back to be there for you mm -hmm. And that's when I'm like, okay, these are my friends who are going to last well beyond high school. These are going to be my friends yeah. for the rest of my life. Yeah, cause because we, we all made a sacrifice. Yeah, we have been all major sacrifices. Still. Whether that's yeah. the cost of an airline ticket, for me, it was I. The night of your father's funeral was the night of Film Fest, mm -hmm. and I had I created the winning film for Film Fest, and I wasn't even there to accept the award. Because it was more important for me to be there for you, be there for my friend. Well, that's like just what Ryan Smith was talking about. Like, <clears throat> you have to have those friends that will do anything for you. Yeah, that, that no will drop everything. I mean, yeah. at this point, yeah. we're really not friends. We're family. I mean, yeah. that's what I consider all of you. So and you need family. to be willing to make that sacrifice yeah. to prove that. And you that's know, the grandpa. Noonan is the uncle. <laughs> Noonan is the weird uncle. <laughs> <laughs> weird uncle. <laughs> do you want to be the fun uncle? Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, you you can be the weird uncle. Pat's uh, I was gonna say Pat's the diddly uncle, but no, yeah. no, he's not. No, no, he's not. No, uh, Mike's the grandma. You can't say I'm that the about grandpa. the face of the podcast. <laughs> yeah, no, Pat's not the diddly uncle. He's he's the funkle. He's the fun uncle. The funkle. You're the weird uncle. Hurley's the fun uncle. Moving on. <laughs> Angela, uh, the baby. The baby. Yes. The the rapper, not the tiny little human being. All right, so this is a, another question, but this we're just going to go for a wrap, and then you can answer this. But <clears throat> do you have any advice for a younger person, somebody who's, like, in high school, not knowing what to do with their life? What is your advice? Try something new and read and listen. So when I was in high school, I very much, I wanted to be an architect for a while, and I wanted to be a math teacher. And then right around junior year, I'm like, I told a teacher I looked up to saying that I wanted to be a math teacher. And she not only told me not to, she got three different teachers I looked up to to come to me and say, this is a really bad idea. You shouldn't do this. And it broke my heart. It was awful. But soon after that happened, that's when I started getting really involved in the media production class that we were all in together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we did that 
that comedy special with Tammy Pescatelli. We started live streaming all of those sports at, for the school and all the concerts at the school. We started making beautiful content to serve the community around us. And I'm like, I love this. I can see myself doing yeah. this every day. And so when we went to that news station on a tour, I asked like how I asked the their editor, their video editor, how can I do your job? Because this is what I want to do. And he said, go get a communication degree. Learn something new. Read a lot. And I did. A, I took his advice and went and got a communication degree. And, you know, I went in thinking, gung-ho, thinking, I'm going to be a video editor the rest of my life, and I'm going to love it. And then I realized that video editors spend eight hours alone a day in a dark room. And that was my reality for a few months during COVID. And it was the worst time in my life, and I got very depressed and very bitter. But the thing is, at the same time, I was loving my classes, loving the readings we were doing even more than I thought I was going to. And so by jumping into something I wasn't sure, completely sure about, I've gone on this different path. I went from being an architect, wanting to be an architect, to wanting to be a math teacher, to wanting to just make videos. And mm -hmm. now I was just accepted into graduate school to get my PhD in communication studies. And based on that friendship paper that I wrote, that's what I submitted for my application. But... I never would have known that I'd have any desire to do that if I didn't just jump in into something new. You know, follow your gut sometimes, but be willing to read, be willing to grow, be willing to ask so many questions and ask for help when you need it. Mm -hmm. And if you're not sure about something, lean on your community. Say, I went to a professor and said, I don't like this class. And he said, I don't like it either. But... <laughs> And he's the teacher. But he said, but it's important to growing as a mm -hmm. communicator. And, you know, I, I'm like, okay, I'm going to take your word for it. Take it seriously. Do the work that's being asked to do. And mm -hmm. it's the class where I learned the most, I think, about how to be a person, how to be a functional communication professional and communication scholar. And... It never would have happened if I didn't jump in and depend on my community for support. Well, also, you said try something new. Yeah. <clears throat> and then you said you wanted to be a video editor, but then you spent four months editing videos in the dark for eight hours, and you learned you didn't like it. Oh, yes, it's all you... about that. It's all about learning what you don't like exactly. more than learning what you do yeah. like. You, 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 out the you shit. wanted to be a video editor, but then you had those four months, which was... If it, even if it was bad, it was still a learning experience, and you learned this is not something I want to do for the rest that, of my yeah. life. Yeah. And now I want to be a teacher again, but of communication. So, kind of. Well, and I'm, comes, I'm, it comes all comes cir full circle eventually, but I'm sure that'll change someday too. Yeah, right. Um, I mean, you answered so well; it's kind of hard to follow yeah. that up. Um, I don't know. I try to live my life according One to three. Mile at a time. <laughs> I, yeah, uh, I live my life by the. Bible of the Fast and the Furious movies. May Dom Toretto uh, <laughs> be with you. Uh, May Dom Toretto be with you. Uh, yeah, like live a quarter mile. No. Um, have patience, show forgiveness, and most importantly, be kind. I think those are the three most important things you can do in life. It's hard. It'll always be hard. You'll never, it'll never be easy. But um, that's the fun of it. Is it'll be hard, and then you kind of overcome it. And if you just kind of try to do those three things, you'll live a good life. You'll be happy. And yeah. And that's, I guess, not my main piece of advice. That's just how I think people should live. For a young person, um, just say fuck it. If someone tells you it's impossible, go prove them wrong. I think a lot of people are going to tell you no in your life. And you say fuck you. I'm going to go do this now because I want to do this. Um, a lot of people are going to look at you like you're crazy for doing something like big. But Always take the big step because it's always worth the fall because you're going to get back up. You have to. You don't have a choice. Don't quit. Get back up. That's the most important thing. You don't stop a fight unless you stop getting up. Mm -hmm. um, and life is a fight because at every turn, you're going to feel like it's the end of the world. I mean, just these past two days, I've had like a ton of stuff going on that I've just been like, oh, it's the end. It's the end. I'm... You just need to take a step back from everything. Just take a deep breath and realize it's never the end of the world is something that's, I think, really important in that 
it's not. You're going to make it to tomorrow. You're going to make it to the next day. You're going to make it to the third day. Just find those people in your life that will help you because that's, you know, even though it feels like the end of the world, you'll always have somebody there as long as you don't throw people out, as long as you're not a jerk, and as long as you're pushing yourself to be the best, the best version of yourself, finding that golden virtue like we were talking about. Um, living life read yeah i mean my, my advice also comes from him read read interact with media um watch movies watch tv um critically think about all of that mm -hmm, yeah. look at it beyond the surface level what does it mean study it um study anything find something you love and just devote yourself to it find a passion outside of your work or maybe your work is your passion that's okay and just devote yourself to it that's you know yeah. Finding what you love is so important. If you just, you know, I, there was a point in my high school career where very near the like beginning of senior year, I didn't know where I was going. I was like, film just doesn't seem like a good option. I don't have that like regular like sort of uh, filmmaker journey where my parents were like, oh, you can't go into film. You'll never make it in film. Um, my parents were super supportive, but I was unsure still. Mm -hmm. I was like, can I make it? Is this a viable career option? And for a while I said no. Um, and then one day I just had this gut instinct and I've learned my gut is more right than it is wrong a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, and I just was like, you know what? I said, fuck it. Fuck it. You know, I'm either going to live a boring and safe life or I'm going to fail and I'm going to get back up and try again. And I went, I applied to a bunch of film schools. I got into a bunch of them. I got into NYU and like into their film school. I didn't go because it's expensive and um, I prefer to not have like a ton of debt. Not that Ithaca is super cheap either, but they gave me money. So Well, this um, is also like <clears throat> you told advice you said was like if you want to start something, just start. Like it doesn't matter. Like, yeah. There's so many young people that want to start oh something, God, whether it's yeah. like a social media or they want to be like the best sandcastle builder or just something. <laughs> but people are telling them like, don't do that. That's stupid. No, so they don't yeah, do yeah. it. But just really, get out there. Just do it. If, yes. if you want to make movies, pick up a pick up a camera. That's what we did through all of Media Pro. We were picking up cameras, just recording some really nasty shit. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> the two Patricks made a video about the new toilet paper we got in the school. <laughs> yeah, like you can make a video. You can about do whatever anything. you want. Pick up a camera, write something, edit it, do all of the things. If you want to be in, I mean, this is more for like in terms of like movie stuff. I mean, just do it because even if you're a screenwriter, go make something mm -hmm. because. Yeah. Guess what? No one's going to want to, like, a lot of people aren't going to want to read your screenplay. I, I've gotten lucky enough where I've had some, like, you know, I've gotten to send screenplays to, like, uh, people at DreamWorks and stuff. And people have, like, read my stuff. But that's just because I was lucky. A lot of the time, you're not going to be. And um, you just got to keep pushing. I mean, I never, th in, in terms of, like, I never thought for a while, at first I was like, I want to be a director, not a writer. But the writing program just seemed so much better at Ithaca. And then I got into the writing program and I was like, wait, no, I want to be a writer. Directing seems so like scary and so challenging. And I have experience in editing and um, camera operation and a lot of other stuff. But directing has always seemed like just like this whole other like hill to climb. And now I'm getting around to a point where I was like, I thought I had somebody that I could work with as my director. And then I've just realized, nah, fuck that. I want to be the director. It's my story. Why do I want so Like there are other people I trust to tell it, but like now I'm writing a short film right now that I'm planning to film at the end of the semester because I'm like, you know what, I, before I leave Ithaca College, I need to try directing. I need to try everything. I want to be a part of everything. I've been getting on more sets. I was just a second AC. I've been an extra. I've been doing just a bunch of stuff, just watching other people work. What um, you just said, tell your story. Don't let other people tell you that, like, don't yeah. let other people show you what your story should be. Tell your you story. should be out there telling want... your story, whether that is filming. Yeah, or whether yeah. that is wanting to be an accountant. Or, or like a sandcastle builder. Back back around to the sandcastle. Exactly. You could, if you made a TikTok channel about sandcastle building, you could. post it once a day, every day, building a different sandcastle. I promise you that blow yeah. up. You ever go to the Mentor Beach Festival? Nope. Mm -hmm. Like, they have professional Immaculate. sandcastle yes. builders who are known around the world who get $30,000 just for coming and building a sandcastle for a day in the city of Mentor. Like... You know, so much money for a oh, sandcastle. It's, it's insane. You should but see them. If you want to do it, is that where our tax dollars are going? It is where your tax dollars. Are going. <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> but I don't still, pay taxes. still, I mean, I do pay taxes. <laughs> still, it's 
you, you gotta recognize that not everything needs to serve some utilitarian purpose. Oh my God, no, There's so much life. that you can just do for the sake of adding beauty to your life. Yeah, and just one more thing in terms of like film and what you're doing. I think at the end of the day, a lot of us like to think what we're doing is super important, but I think something you need to realize is it's not as important as you think it is. And I'm coming from a film perspective, is I want my films, you know, I want to be up there with the legends. I want to be among Stanley Kubrick, Steven Spielberg, all those like legends of filmmaking, because their films are so important. You got to take a step back and realize at the end of the day, what anybody makes, what anybody does, is not as important as you think it is. And it's not necessarily what you do that matters, but how you do it. And what I want, I don't want to live my life trying to be the greatest person because it's it's nice to be important, but it's mm -hmm. way more important to be nice. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, I want to comport myself as a good human being. I want my actions to speak louder than what I make. I want to be remembered not for the great films I make. I mean, sure, that's going to be really nice if I am, but I'd really like to be remembered for being kind and for being... Someone on set who wasn't, like, forcing his actresses to, like, like pretty much psychologically torturing his actresses. Because Stanley Kubrick, he's remembered as one of the greatest directors of all time. I mean, The Shining, Clockwork Orange, Barry Lyndon, Eyes Wide Shut, and then 2001 A Space Odyssey. Probably the greatest journey a camera has ever gone on. But he was an asshole. And everybody remembers him as an asshole. And no matter how good he made those films and how much I adore him as a filmmaker. I will always know he was such an asshole in mm -hmm. real life and how he comported himself. And Which that, that takes away from some of his films. It, it does. When I watch them, that's what I think. When I'm watching The Shining, I remember how he treated the lead actress whose name is escaping me at the moment. It, it's just, it's absolutely horrible. Yeah, and but when, <clears throat> when you think something's going to matter, just lengthen the timeline. In 10,000 years, Nobody's going to remember any of us, so it's much more important to be kind and lead with love mm -hmm. than to try and make the perfect film, try and be this perfect human being. Yeah, and that's something I want to do with everything I make, um, and that's something I want to imbue into all of it. I have these like themes that I want in all my work, and that's definitely one of them, is that like what we're doing is important now, but at the end of the day, it's more important how you're acting mm -hmm. and who you're being rather than what you're making and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I think it all just comes back to the main point of this whole conversation. Love other people. Lead with love. Lead with love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amazing.